at any rate, it's really a pleasure to be here and, of course, a privilege to, um, to give this lecture and to tell you about uh, some of the work that we've done over the past uh, several years. And this work is really uh, focused on trying to understand uh, the molecular architecture and mechanisms of molecules at uh, chemical synapses of the central nervous system and to not only learn <clears throat> what they look like, but how they function, and of course, how we might either perturb or modulate their activities. I, uh, I actually had wanted to uh, show a slide of this uh, William Blake poem called The Tiger. I don't know if you're familiar with it at all, but I decided not to because of time. But still, I, I figured I would allude to it, not only because I'm here in England, uh, but also because uh, <clears throat> this short poem written uh, almost uh, 200 years ago throughout alludes to the notion of symmetry. And, uh, and as you'll see during the course of my talk, this notion of, of symmetry within the context of uh, receptors for neurotransmitters and transporters for neurotransmitters <clears throat> looms very large. And I think that it provides a really kind of wonderful uh, framework for us to understand and to perhaps remember and to reflect on uh, mechanism, structure, and function. So uh, we're really interested and I'm, I'm <clears throat> have been consumed with this interest uh, really uh, from the days of my first academic position in trying to understand uh, how signaling is uh, carried out at central nervous system synapses. And uh, one can uh, conceptualize this process as being composed of three different steps. That is, there's, of course, a release step of transmitters from the vesicles that you see in the presynaptic neuron. There's detection by receptors primarily located in that postsynaptic density on the postsynaptic cell. And then there's removal of transmitter from the cleft by sodium-coupled neurotransmitter transporters that are located uh, both on neurons and on surrounding glial cells. And these transporters quench this chemical gradient of neurotransmitter and allow for subsequent cycles of, uh, <clears throat> of activation. And what I'd like to do today is really talk about these last two steps in the process of signal transduction, that is detector of transmitter and removal by transporters. So, um, you know, like with everything else, one wonders how to distill uh, lots of things down to a short period of time. And like many of you, of course, I'm faced with the same question today. And, uh, and while our work over the last <clears throat> period of time, 10, 15 years, uh, has involved a number of different receptors and transport proteins, most of which I won't talk, about, talk to you about today, I wanted to begin by simply mentioning that now we know a great deal about the structures and mechanisms of many of these molecules. And from this point forward, we'll really be able to interrogate their activity and their mechanism in the future. And this includes uh, ATP-gated P2X receptors, of which we now have uh, agonist-bound and APO states of the P2X4 receptor. We also understand a great deal now about acid-sensing ion channels from structures in multiple different states, both desensitized and open states. Of course, we've learned a, a great deal about glutamate receptors, uh, both from studies of isolated binding domains and uh, more recently the intact structure. And then uh, most recently, we've been able to elucidate the full structure of a eukaryotic pentameric glutamate-gated chloride channel. Today, uh, in the interest of wanting to communicate to you some principles of, uh, of structure and mechanism of a system that I believe we understand at least reasonably well, I want to focus on glutamate-gated receptors <clears throat> that are in the ionotropic glutamate receptor family, and, and in particular to concentrate on uh, the AMP receptor. So my talk today will really have two parts, mostly uh, two-thirds of it on, uh, on ionotropic glutamate receptors, and then the last third or so 
on neurotransmitter sodium symporters, of which I'll use a bacterial, a bacterial model as a, as a paradigm. So ionotropic glutamate receptors, these are the, these are the receptors in our <clears throat> synapses that mediate uh, most of the fast excitatory neurotransmission in our brain. And uh, despite the fact that the initial notion that glutamate was a neurotransmitter really was uh, <clears throat> cropped up in the 1950s, it took quite a long time for it to be well established that glutamate in fact was the primary neurotransmitter. And this was due to many factors, but it really wasn't until the 1980s that it was well defined as uh, the primary neurotransmitter. And uh, this, this uh, evolution in our thinking arose really from a pharmacological perspective, and that is due to the synthesis and characterization of multiple different molecules that could selectively activate different glutamate receptors, and they are uh, so-called AMPA, the neurotoxin, naturally occurring neurotoxin kinate, and the synthetic molecule uh, NMDA. And so this, uh, this kind of pharmacological characterization foreshadowed gene analysis, and when the genes were cloned and the amino acid sequences predicted, it was also the case that uh, there were three families of glutamate receptors that really mirrored the pharmacological uh, characterization, and they are the GLUA1 through 4 AMPA receptors, the kinate receptors 1 through 5, and the two really different subtypes of NMDA receptors, that is the GLUIN1 glycine binding receptors and the GLUIN2 glutamate binding subunits. All of these receptors share common sequences. They share common functional properties, yet, of course, because of differences in sequence, they have unique properties. <clears throat> Nevertheless, all of these receptors assemble as, hetero, as, uh, as tetrameric assemblies, that is, the functional receptor unit is a tetramer, and while AMP and kinate receptors can assemble and function as a homomeric entity, NMDA receptors are obligate heteromers composed typically of two gluin-1 and two gluin-2 binding subunits. So what I would like to do today is to really tell you something first about what we understand about the mechanism of these receptors, to then focus on the architecture of an intact receptor, and then at the very end in a, in a movie, a short movie, give you some insights into uh, the overall movements that an intact receptor may undergo while it's uh, signaling at synapses. So our work in this area really got started after my move to Columbia, where we uh, began by elucidating uh, the structure of just the binding domain of the uh, rat GLUA2 receptor, and we were able to take advantage of work from Kerry Kynanen, a former postdoc at Peter Seberg, to excise the ligand binding domain genetically and express this small fragment of the receptor, which was remarkable because it really recapitulates the pharmacology of an intact receptor, and then determine its crystal structure. And what we found was that it had a clamshell-like clamshell -like shape. <clears throat> and the important thing to remember about this construct is that we sever all the transmembrane domains and also release this amino terminal domain. So all what we're left with to study is this ligand binding fragment, which contains the glutamate or AMPA binding domain. So this clamshell, of course, told us what a fraction of the receptor looked like, but it didn't tell us much about pharmacology yet until we proceeded to determine crystal structures with uh, antagonists, the classically used quinoxaline dione DNQX and an amino acid-like antagonist uh, named ATPO. And while these two different antagonists have completely different structures, they do the same thing in the context of both structure and function. That is, they bind to the cleft of the clamshell and stabilize the clamshell in an open cleft conformation, thus rendering the channel inactive and incapable of gating. By contrast, agonists such as glutamate, AMP, and quisqualate close the clamshell. They bind in the same region of the, of the uh, receptor fragment, thus, of course, explaining the uh, competitive antagonism of, of DNQX, as an example. And they give rise to the same level of receptor activation as measured under conditions where we've blocked desensitization. <clears throat> 
So even though these agonists have different structures, again, they do the same thing. They bind to the same general site with some differences in orientation, but they have the same common principle of action. And that is the common principle of activation of a glutamate receptor at the level of this individual fragment is that agonists promote domain closure. That is, they close the clamshell, if you will. So of course, we next wanted to understand how this closure of a single fragment might uh, be involved in activation. And what we've learned is that the, these agonist binding domains actually assemble in an intact receptor as dimers. And we learned that by studying two different variants of the receptor. One is where we have mutated a leucine residue in this binding domain to a lysine. And the second is where we studied the receptor fragment in the presence of a small molecule called cyclothiazide. Both of these perturbations have the profound effect of nearly entirely blocking desensitization. And that's shown here, where you can see that for a wild type receptor expressed in a hex cell and recorded from an outside out patch, desensitization is profound, even though saturating glutamate remains present throughout the perfusion. In both of these cases, both for the cyclothiazide complex and for the leucine to tyrosine mutation, we see the same effect. We see that these receptor fragments, these clamshells, now assemble as dimeric entities in a kind of back-to-back -back fashion, where the tyrosine residue is at a subunit interface, making extensive interactions with residues on a neighboring subunit. And if we look down the two-fold axis of symmetry, we see one such interface here, a second symmetry-related interface here. And what both the mutation and the chemical compound do is they knit together this interface, stabilize this interface, and thus allow for receptor activation. And they allow for receptor activation because now the clamshells are positioned such that when each clamshell closes, the region of the receptor that's proximal to the ion channel, this is the part of the receptor that's coupled to the ion channel domain, it separates, and it's this separation that promotes ion channel activation or gating. How do we understand desensitization? So desensitization is a common feature of many receptors, of course, and particularly in the case of ligand-gated ion channels. It's a kind of internal timer. It allows the receptor to turn itself off even after prolonged application of agonist. What we found, in short, is that desensitization involves rupture of this same dimer interface. Now, I want to remind you, again, that RAMPA receptors, as well as many other receptors, desensitize rapidly and profoundly. We can understand this process. If the receptor binds glutamate, it has either two choices. It can either open or it can desensitize. In the case of AMPA receptors, opening and desensitization in this very simplistic mechanistic scheme is nearly the same in terms of rate. The important feature is that recovery from the desensitized state is very low. It's, uh, so the receptor is essentially trapped thermodynamically in this pit, and the recovery from this state is very slow. How does desensitization work? To figure this out, what we did is we made a series of single cysteine substitutions across this interface of our clamshell that's close to the dimer interface. And what we found was that there was one particular substitution of a serine residue to a cysteine that gave rise to a receptor that elicited very little current pre-application of a reducing agent, yet post-application of a reducing agent, the current was potentiated dramatically. When we analyze this receptor by Western blotting using these oocyte membranes, we find that most of the receptor now migrates as a dimer. And when we reduce the membranes, it, this band collapses to a single a subunit mass, thus suggesting that a disulfide bond is formed and that perhaps would have trapped the receptor in a desensitized state. I don't have time to, to tell you uh, all the other experiments that we did, but we showed that, that the oxidized form retains high affinity agonist binding. So this perturbation is not just simply that we've blocked agonist binding. We went on to do the crystal structure of this double cysteine mutant. And what we find is that we have a, now a disulfide bond between the two clamshells. And by contrast with what we think is the non-desensitized state, where the clamshells are knit together in this back-to-back-like fashion, this interface is now ruptured. It's undergone this dramatic rupturing. It's completely cleaved away. Subunits have rotated relative to each other by 15 degrees each. 
And what this does is it returns the region of the receptor that's proximal to the ion channel domain to a resting state like conformation, even though agonist is in fact bound to the clamshell. So this explains how desensitization works, or at least one form of desensitization in amphoreceptors, and that is this dimer interface ruptures, and it's this rupturing of the interface, this kind of desensitization gate that now decouples agonist binding from ion channel gating. And in this simple morph, we can see the movement that's involved in this. It's a, it's a rotation of each subunit, rupture of this interface, and return of the ion channel proximal regions close to a resting state like conformation. Okay, so now we can put together a very simple model of, of receptor gating. Glutamate binds to the clamshells. Clamshells close, ion channel opens, and desensitization involves rupture of this dimer interface and return of the ion channel to a closed resting state like conformation. Now, of course, these uh, studies of the isolated clamshell were, were interesting and informative uh, beyond actually my initial expectations. And um, uh, yet, what we really wanted to do, of course, was to study an intact receptor and because of various <clears throat> essentially technical problems as well as a shortage of money. Uh, we were uh, not able to do this uh, for quite a while, but yet after a fair amount of effort, we were able to, to make some progress. And so what I want to tell you now is something about the uh, structure of an intact rat amphoreceptor, and in particular, the really interesting relationships of symmetry in this receptor that I think are relevant to, to receptor assembly and, um, and also to function, particularly for heteromeric assemblies that occur uh, <clears throat> primarily uh, in, our, in our brains. So this is uh, the crystal structure of the rat GLUA2 receptor bound to a competitive antagonist. The competitive antagonist is bound right here. And there are a few features of this receptor that I'd like to point out to you. Uh, first is just an overall orientation. This is uh, transmembrane region, so the cytoplasm and the PSD is down here. Uh, the extracellular region is up here, so this is the synapse. It's a layered-like structure, kind of like a layer cake, with these amino terminal domains up here. Those were some of the domains that we lopped off in those studies of the isolated clamshells. These are the agonist binding domains, or the ligand binding domains that I told you about before, and much to our relief and gratification, of course, uh, they're assembled as dimeric entities, much like the isolated fragments that we studied for many years. And so that gives one some traction to say that the studies of the isolated domains are relevant to the intact receptor. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention <clears throat> is that the ion channel region is here, and its architecture, even though I won't go into it in much detail, is much like that of an inverted potassium channel or at least the five, six segments of a kind of classic potass potassium channel or segments one through two of KCSA. Nevertheless, I also want to point out the rather unusual uh, shape of this receptor, and I'll mention again <clears throat> in a subsequent slide a few more details about this, but to point out that in this view, it's rather narrow, but when we come around 90 degrees, it has a shape like the capital letter Y. And so really different from our views of, say, the acetylcholine receptor provided by Nigel Unwin or trimeric channels such as P2X or, or, or acid-sensing ion channels, which when you rotate them around their axis of symmetry and take a slice through the middle, they look kind of approximately the same and they're kind of, they're, they're kind of vase-shaped. They're rotationally rather symmetric. <clears throat> Whereas this is, is absolutely not. It's really different in, in overall shape. And in fact, I'll show you in a minute that in fact, there's only an overall twofold axis of symmetry that relates one half to the other, in spite of the fact that the channel really has beautiful K channel like fourfold symmetry. Okay, so <clears throat> this is really why amphoreceptors, and I would argue the other ionotopic glutamate receptors are really different, because unlike ASICs or P2X receptors, K channels, cis loop receptors, gap junctions, or mechanosensitive channels, where the number of subunits uh, is equivalent to the infold symmetry of the assembly, 
<clears throat> in the case of glutamate receptors, despite the fact that we have four subunits, there's only an overall two-fold axis of symmetry. So, um, so what does this kind of mean in, in, in a little bit more detail, and, and how, can you kind of, how can you visualize it? Well, what I've shown here now is this intact homomeric rat AMPA receptor now analyzed by domain layer. This is the amino terminal domain layer, ligand binding domains, transmembrane domains. And if we look down from the top on each of these layers, what we see is that there's one set of subunits, and these are the so-called BD subunits. These two are equivalent, actually. That's why they're colored the same color. Whereas the AC subunits here are different, okay? They're different. And in our ligand binding domain layer, again, we see a, we have a two-fold symmetry. These two are related but to each other, as are these two. And then overall, each of these dimers is related to the other pair of dimers by this overall axis of two-fold symmetry. And then the ion channel domain is four-fold symmetric, much like an inverted K channel. So you might ask, you know, who cares, right? Well, the interesting thing is that because there's this symmetry mismatch between the layers, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this layer later, but, but because there's two-fold symmetry in these layers, and there's four-fold symmetry in the transmembrane region, it means the way in which A and B subunits, as an example, are coupled between the ligand binding domain layer and the transmembrane domain layer, it means that the way in which they're coupled must be different, okay? It's because we've got this symmetry mismatch. So what this means is that it means that even though we have a homomeric receptor, we have subunits with two different conformations. That is, we have a subunit pair that's AC, where A and C are equivalent, and we have another pair, BD, where BD is equivalent, but those two pairs are distinct from each other, okay? Why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting because it suggests that the way in which agonist binding or modulation is uh, coupled between the ligand binding domain layer, or for that matter, any other part of the extracellular domain, to the ion channel will be different whether or not that stimulus is applied to an AC pair or a BD pair. And in fact, we know from studies from Mark Mayer's lab that heteromeric kinate receptors assemble where GLUR6 is in the BD position and the Ka2 subunit is in the AC position. And there's data from Lonnie Walmus lab and other groups which suggest that for NMDA receptors, which are obligate heteromers, the NR2 subunit is in the BD position, and the NR1 subunit is in the AC position. <clears throat> and so, uh, so what does this do? Well, this, you know, of course, this, uh, this provides a mechanism whereas additional complexity can be conferred upon a receptor simply by the architecture of the assembly. That is, in the case of the homomeric receptor, we have the same polypeptide subunits, right? But my, but my hunch and my guess is that those, the AC and the BD pair actually have different properties and that these properties are taken advantage of by assembly of our native heteromeric receptors where now we have AC sockets, if you will, or B D sockets, if you will, and distinct subunits are plugged into those different sockets. Okay, so to just drive this point home, here's an AC, here's an A subunit, here's a B subunit. They're oriented equivalently by the ligand dome binding domain layer, and you can see how they really have different shapes. Okay, if we look at an AC pair or a BD pair, you see the same thing. We orient them equivalently according to the transmembrane layer in this particular representation. You can see that the overall shapes of the AC pair are entirely different from the BD pair. So they really are different conformations of the same polypeptide. Okay, well, how does this sort itself out? You know, what, what does this mean in kind of some details? And I could tell you lots and lots about it. I'll just try to make one point here. Well, I want to focus on this M3 segment. It turns out the M3 segment is, is really crucial for gating of these channels. And, and if you perturb it very much, you really profoundly perturb channel gating. It's, it's the equivalent segment of, say, S6 in a voltage-gated channel. It's what closes the smoke hole, if you will, of KCSA, for example. 
<clears throat> and it turns out that if we follow the path of this polypeptide, okay, in our intact receptor, we see that this polypeptide for the AC pair follows this path here, whereas the BD path is followed here, okay? So again, you can see how the different subunits, AC versus BD, really have different conformations. And the way in which the polypeptide connects the agonist binding domain to the ion channel is very different, okay? How does it do it? Well, uh, this is simply another view. Well, it does it, it does it, this kind of is accomplished in a stereochemical sort of fashion by the fact that this end of the M3 helix can either form an additional turn of alpha helix as seen in the AC pair, or it can unwind and stretch out as in the BD pair. And when it stretches out, it allows for the polypeptide to reach, if you will, its destination in the cognate agonist binding domains of the, of the B and D subunits. And so you could, you could ask, well, you know, um, why does this happen? Well, it's just the fundamental, essentially, kind of mathematical consequence of having a fourfold symmetric ion channel embedded within the context of a twofold symmetric kind of parallelogram, if you will, of binding domain subunits. So it's the fact that we have these kind of competing symmetries. There's this fourfold symmetry of the ion channel domain, twofold symmetry of the binding domains, and that gives rise to this symmetry mismatch, whereas the way in which subunits are coupled to the pore are really, truly different. Okay, so um, I'd like to end this part of my talk with, with a highly speculative uh, morph. And this morph is, uh, <clears throat> it starts from an experimental state, that is the structure that I just told you about of the antagonist bound rat GLUA2 receptor. And we've morphed into open and desensitized states using the structures of our isolated clamshell domains, as well as using the open state of a K channel as a model for the open state of an AMP receptor, which obviously uh, has uh, tremendous limitations and it's maybe mostly incorrect, yet nevertheless, I feel like it's, it's of course, a lot of fun to watch, and I think it's also interesting. It suggests further experiments, as well as shows us what might actually be going on in the context of the synapse. So we have, of course, uh, at this point, and there's a recording that's kind of choreographed to this so that the channel and the record dance along together. We have agonist binding, uh, channel, this is channel deactivation now, agonist is falling off, channel opening, desensitization, deactivation, channel opening. And when we come around again, <clears throat> I'll make a couple of points. One is something that we didn't expect at all, and that is that when the channel opens, the ligand binding domain comes much, or we predict that it comes much closer to the membrane bilayer. This is interesting because native receptors are surrounded by a number of modulatory transmembrane proteins, both TARPs and cornichons, that sit in the membrane bilayer. And it then pr it provides a really nice explanation for how these accessory proteins can, are readily positioned to modulate, modulate channel activity because they're so close to the binding domains that are undergoing these large conformational changes. The second point I want to make is that is this question of symmetry. These are the connections to our uh, ion channel, and, um, and they're completely different uh, in the sense that there's fourfold symmetry at the ion channel level, yet only twofold symmetry at the ligand binding domain level. And then the final point I want to make is that if we look at the motion of the intact receptor, you can see how there are these very large movements that occur throughout the receptor. And in fact, there are probably actually larger movements in the true receptor when we are able to study it. And what this means, of course, is that within the context of the synaptic cleft, the receptor is undergoing these dramatic conformational changes as signaling proceeds. Okay, so in, this, in the last part of my talk, I'd like to tell you about our work on, on LUT. So LUT is a, is a model for neurotransmitter sodium symporters, and it's really, uh, I think, really served us very well to show us something about the overall architecture 
of these, of these molecules, as well as to tell us a lot about mechanism, not only mechanism of transport, but mechanism of inhibition. And so in terms of sequence, amino acid sequence, LUT is related, not at a high level, about 20% 20, 20 amino acid sequence identity, but it's clearly related to the glycine, GABA, and the biogenic amine transporters. <clears throat> And of course, in the context of the central nervous system, instead of a uh, transmitter being quenched by hydrolysis like acetylcholine is, transmitter is taken up in the cleft, thus quenching the signal. And so the, not only is, are these transporters important for uh, reuptake, so to speak, but they're also the target of a very large number of both uh, clinical, uh, clinically useful drugs as well as uh, substances of abuse particularly for, uh, for antidepressants, as well as in the illicit category of cocaine and amphetamines. And the common feature of most of these molecules, particularly antidepressants, is that they block the activity of biogenic amine transporters, thus uh, in a very simplistic model, allowing transmitter in the cleft to, uh, to build up. So uh, I want to focus on two uh, elements of LUT. First, I want to give you some just general ideas about transport mechanism and modes of inhibition. And at the very end, I'll finish with uh, <clears throat> concepts of symmetry and how this relates to, to transporter mechanism. So uh, I think it's fair to say that um, you, know, you could ask, well, what is there to do? Um, and uh, and, you know, uh, it really humbles one to appreciate how much has already been done. And, and in fact, Peter Mitchell, now many years ago, I think it's fair to say, had some of the, some of the most correct insights into how uh, these transporters functioned, even though a number of the ideas he put forth were, were not quite right. He, he got some of the major features uh, correct. And, uh, and this was back in the time when uh, there was a question of how molecules, how molecules made it through membranes. And of course, there was an idea that, um, that there were carriers in membranes, much like hemoglobin is a carrier in our bloodstream. There were carriers in membranes that, that could bind a molecule from one side, and this carrier might tumble and diffuse throughout a membrane bilayer, and then would uh, stochastically release it to the other side. In other words, these carriers were really kind of diffusing across the bilayer. They weren't fixed in either position or orientation. Um, <clears throat> Mitchell thought that was not quite right, and in a very nice paper in the late 1950s, he put forth some models for how these how these uh, transporters might work. And, uh, and he made the point that, especially in the case of coupled transport, where you have an ion gradient that's coupled to the movement of a substrate, that you could understand this coupling of transport by coupled binding. In other words, in order to get coupled transport, all that you really need to do is get coupled binding. So the idea is that not only does the transporter provide a binding site that lowers the energy barrier for a molecule to cross this hydrophobic bilayer, <clears throat> but by coupling binding of the substrate, these red stars, with some ion, such as sodium, by coupling the binding <clears throat> and by exploiting a pre-existing gradient, such as that generated by ATP aces, where the concentration of ion is high on the outside and low on the inside, one can then create a driving force such that you can concentrate the substrate on the inside of the cell. <clears throat> and this can largely be understood by this concept of coupled binding, which we've really nicely seen. <clears throat> and then, uh, of course, what needs to happen is the transporter needs to undergo some type of conformational change where instead of being open to the outside, it's now open to the inside and ions and substrates can unbind and, um, and diffuse into the cytoplasm. Okay, so uh, when we solved the first crystal structure of LUT back <clears throat> nearly eight years ago, uh, in spite of the fact that, as we ended up finding out, both ions and substrates were bound, when we just looked at the molecule in a surface representation, we, we couldn't see them. And that's because ions and substrates are bound uh, to an occluded pocket. They're bound to the middle, bound within the middle of the transporter, close in space, that is, 
thus kind of explaining how you could get coupled binding, because the binding sites are really very close together. They're, they're just structurally coupled. <clears throat> and uh, and there, it's an occluded site. That is to say that the substrate is accessible to neither the outside nor the inside. So obviously, the model of Mitchell uh, needs to be uh, <clears throat> expanded a bit to where we have m more than two conformations. And that is that we have some outward facing conformation that can bind substrate. We have an occluded state. And then this occluded state, we think, isomerizes to an inward facing state. This inward facing state can then open up and allow substrates and ions to unbind. And then this can then return to a, a outward facing open conformation for a subsequent cycle of substrate uh, binding and transport. So what I'd like to tell you about today is, is what we've learned over the past several years about how these transporters work in very general sense, not only in terms of their transport mechanism, but I also want to tell you something that we've learned about modes of competitive inhibition. That is, how can we understand how competitive inhibitors work and also how, uh, excuse me, how non-competitive inhibition functions. That is, how you can have modulation of transport activity by a molecule binding at a site that's remote from the primary or central binding pocket. OK, so as I mentioned <clears throat> uh, just a couple of slides ago, our first structure was of this uh, so-called occluded state. And again, when we look at this occluded state and we slice the molecule down the center, such as the inside is here and the outside is here, we see that, in fact, the substrate, which in the case of LUT is leucine, the substrate is occluded both from the inside and from the outside. And uh, most remarkably, the occlusion, the barrier of substrate to the inside is a, is a, 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 deep, uh, a deep, nearly 20 angstrom path of packed protein, thus very effectively insulating substrate and ions from the inside. So the, the characteristic features of this occluded state is that it's a substrate bound state. It's occluded, yet it's mostly facing to the outside. There's this large extracellular vestibule. There's a so-called thin extracellular gate. That is, there are just a few residues that block substrate diffusion back to the outside, and a thick cytoplasmic gate. And it's almost as though these transporters, uh, in the case of LUT at least, are adopting an outward-facing conformation ready to bind substrate. And this is interesting because, uh, because it's thought that in synapses, one of the first mechanisms for quenching a neurotransmitter in the cleft is rapid binding, and that in fact binding is fast relative to transport. So you can imagine that you first have the binding of the uh, transmitter to the transporter, and then on a slower time scale, isomerization to an inward facing state and actual transport. And then the final point that I'll make again is that the substrate and sodium ions are close in space, thus explaining this mechanism of coupling. We then, of course, were interested in understanding what an APO state looked like. And so we focused on crystallizing LUT in the absence of substrate. <clears throat> and when we look at this structure, also in a similar slice through the molecule, what we see is that in the sodium bound APO state, now the substrate side is entirely uh, accessible to the outside. That is, it's ready to bind substrate. And thus, uh, the substrate side is, is uh, accessible, and substrate can come on and off very rapidly. And the conformational changes that are required to allow substrate access to the binding site are only small tilts in two helices around hinge points about halfway across the membrane bilayer. And of course, most importantly, in this APO state, our cytoplasmic gate remains closed. That is, um, of course, what defines a transporter as opposed to a channel. Transporters must have at least two gates that open in a mutually exclusive fashion. And so thus we can see, or we see how it is that the external gate can open, and yet the inside, the cytoplasmic gate, remains closed. Okay. So uh, we next wanted to understand uh, how these molecules uh, can be inhibited in a competitive fashion. And there were a 
really a tremendous number of experiments that went into these studies, which I just don't have time to, to tell you about. But suffice it to say that what we did was to screen through many different amino acids and try to find amino acids that inhibited LUT in a competitive manner. And what we found was that tryptophan, tryptophan was such a, a molecule that is, we found that tryptophan could bind to LUT, but yet it inhibited transport in a manner of co in a competitive mechanism. And what we found when we determined the structure of the tryptophan complex was that there was a single tryptophan uh, molecule bound at the primary binding site, that's the central binding site, the same binding site that substrate binds to. And what tryptophan does when it binds to this pocket is it locks the transporter in an APO open to the out like conformation. Okay. And, uh, and thus, we would argue that one mode of competitive inhibition of these transporters is uh, to simply use a molecule that occupies the substrate binding site, yet locks the transporter in an outward facing open conformation. And, <clears throat> and so uh, tryptophan very effectively binds and stabilizes this outward facing open conformation. And we would argue, and we now have data, which I, I'm not quite able to tell you about yet, but we have data that, that suggests that this tryptophan bound state is a, uh, is a very nice model for um, the, uh, the, the bound state of, say, the biogenic amine transporters in complexes with SSRIs or TCAs and so on. OK, so um, <clears throat> we, uh, we then uh, also looked at modes of non-competitive inhibition. And we essentially stumbled upon this because we were uh, very naive back in the early days of studying LUT. And, uh, and we screened through many different molecules of, that inhibit eukaryotic neurotransmitters, symporters. And we found that TCAs, or tricyclic antidepressants, uh, inhibited LUT by way of a non-competitive mechanism. And when we went on to determine the crystal structure, what we found is that TCAs, such as clomipramine, shown here, this is clomipramine, bind to the occluded state of LUT with micromolar affinities and a slow down the off rate of substrate. <clears throat> and they slow down the off rate and therefore inhibit a transport probably by one mechanism, and that is that they, they plug up this extracellular vestibule. And so not only do they block uh, substrate unbinding from the outside, but they probably also interfere with conformational changes in this part of the transporter that are required for isomerization to the inside, and thus also slowing unbinding of substrates and ions to the inside. So while this is not a model for how TCAs or antidepressants inhibit neuro eukaryotic neurotransmitter symporters, it was an interesting study because it showed us how a small molecule could bind to a transporter at a site that's distinct from the primary binding site and modulate activity in a non-competitive manner. And of course, in the case of, of neurotransmitter symporters and of serotonin transporter, for example, there are a number of clinically relevant molecules that modulate activities of these transporters and that is uh, thought to be therapeutically relevant and important. So antidepressants and other small molecules bind in this extracellular vestibule. It's a kind of hydrophobic uh, pocket that will accommodate many different molecules. It, they inhibit by a non-competitive mechanism, and they slow transport. They inhibit transport by slowing substrate unbinding, which we showed in a, in a number of unbinding experiments, which, again, I, I don't have time to tell you about. So really, the last piece of the puzzle that I'm able to uh, talk to you about today are studies that we've done to trap this inward-facing conformation. And this required a number of things, because it turns out that LUT really likes to adopt an outward-facing state. We used <clears throat> uh, a number of uh, mutants that, that favor an inward-facing conformation. These mutants were really derived from from mutational studies done on eukaryotic transporters, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, isolating a conformationally specific antibody. That is an antibody that specifically recognized this inward facing state. And by, uh, by those different combinations of methods, we were able to trap an inward facing state. 
And again, it's shown here in a similar sort of representation where now what's happened is that we have a large intracellular cytoplasmic vestibule that allows for aqueous cavity all the way to the sodium and substrate binding sites. So it's entirely open on the inside, but what's happened on the outside is that cytoplasmic gate has now closed, such that now we have a very thick gate to the outside and entire access to the inside. And of course, this again is consistent with this notion that the way in which transporters must work is by alternately uh, <clears throat> allowing access to either the inside or to the outside, and that opening of both gates is mutually exclusive. And it's mutually exclusive because it turns out there are elements of structure in this part of the transporter that when one side opens, the other side must close. Okay, so, um, so the key points are the extracellular gate is closed in this inward-facing state, the inward facing state harbors this large solvent accessible uh, cavity and, um, and that the substrate and ion binding sites are accessible now to the cytoplasm. What we don't have yet, but which uh, a group, uh, another group uh, is working on the structure of, uh, of derived from a closely related molecule is a inward facing occluded state of lutein. And the reason we don't have that uh, I don't know, but, um, but either, either my lab or, or somebody else, I'm sure, will sure we'll get at that. So, um, so I've told you something about <clears throat> kind of uh, changes in shape and conformation and accessibility of, uh, of LUT uh, during this transport cycle or around the transport cycle and how uh, various molecules can stabilize one state or another state competitive inhibitors on the one hand or non-competitive inhibitors on the other hand. Um, so now what I'd like to try to communicate to you is to give you at least a little bit of a sense of how one might understand this at the level of the actual structure of the, of the transporter. Well, it, it turns out that um, we didn't know this and, and neither did anyone else, even though the gene sequences and protein sequences were available for a long time before the structure. But, uh, but we didn't appreciate it. Um, we didn't appreciate that within the sequence of LUT, there's an internal repeat. And, uh, and at the level of amino acid sequence, this repeat is just too faint to pick up by sequence analysis. You just, you can't see it because the two halves are just so divergent from one another. And it wasn't really until we saw the structure that it, uh, it hit us over the head. And, uh, and so what's going on is as follows, is that uh, LUT has 12 transmembrane segments, and the first five are related to the second five by a pseudo twofold axis of symmetry that's about in the plane of the membrane and coming out at the screen. So that to a first approximation, and this really is approximate because there's a lot of, there are a lot of little differences, but to a first approximation, you can take TMs one through five and rotate them by 180 degrees and come up with TM six through 10, okay? So it's as though we have kind of one hand on this side of coming from the cytoplasm and another hand coming from the extracellular side, and these two hands have this pseudo twofold symmetry, okay? And of course, you know, this probably came about because in evolution, these molecules originally might have just been a single unit uh, that homodimerized and just functioned by just catalyzing transport. And so there was no reason to have a differential outside or inside. Uh, but whatever the case, this, this feature of pseudosymmetry, while it had been seen previously in a couple of membrane proteins, notably say the aquaporins, it's now been seen over and over again in transporters where there's, you have this internal symmetry. And then we have two TM segments at the end that are just kind of tacked on and we really don't know what they're doing, but, but they don't conform to this internal twofold symmetry. And if we look at the actual structure, you might be able to pick out some of these symmetry relationships because uh, in pink, these, uh, these two pink helices here, these are nine and 10, and you might be able to see how they're related to four and five. Four and five are right there. So you might be able to see how if we just flip nine and 10 over, we get four and five. 
Likewise, TMs two and seven, this is two here in green and seven over there, okay? If we just rotate this one 180 degrees, we can get that guy. And then TM1 is red here, and TM6 is red over there. So again, you might be able to get a little bit of a sense of, of this kind of internal symmetry. And if I rotate the molecule around a bit, uh, <clears throat> you may be able to, to see it a little bit better. You have TMs 1 and 6, OK? And again, substrate is bound, and ions are bound right, right in the middle of the transporter. So, uh, so what does this have to do with mechanism? Well. <clears throat> you know, uh, this is our original occluded state right here. This is our original occluded state. And I just, I told you already that in order to go to the APO, outward facing state, you only have to have small conformational changes of TMs one and six to allow access to the outside. Then substrates and ions can bind and unbind. Now, if you just take advantage of this symmetry, if you just take advantage of this symmetry and essentially flip these two segments from the inside to the outside, these two from the outside to the inside by application of this pseudo twofold axis of rotation, what you get is instead of an outward facing state, you get an inward facing state, right? So, um, so you might be able to, to, to understand that, that these transporters could just work very simplistically. They might just work by a kind of oscillation of these TM segments from an outward facing conformation to an inward facing conformation by these two moving to close the extracellular gate while these two move to open the intracellular gate and these non-helical segments in the middle allowing some flexibility to allow kind of opening, small openings or closings from either the outside or the inside, okay? Is it really that simple? Well, you know, kind of. Uh, it is kind of that simple, not quite though. And that is that if we look at our outward facing conformation, I already told you that you can get these small movements of these TM segments, 1B and 6A, to open and close the outside, right? So when we close the outside, these TM segments move to these positions. Close the outside, substrates and ions are bound. What happens when we go to the inward facing conformation, the structure that we now have? Do one and six really move symmetrically? Well, not quite. They don't quite move sy symmetrically. What happens is that these guys do move to close this extracellular gate. That happens very nicely. But to open the intracellular gate, TM segment 1A undergoes a dramatic conformational change of about a 45 degree movement, whereas 6B moves relatively little. So in a very general sense, this kind of simplistic rigid body motion or movement that's really kind of derived from the internal symmetry gives you a conceptual framework upon which to understand how these transporters can function. That is, they can open to the outside or open to the inside, and this is a kind of pseudo twofold symmetric relationship. It's not quite that simple, and there are some deviations from that symmetry. And of course, the deviations from that symmetry are undoubtedly rooted in the fact that the amino acid sequences for the first half, TMs one through five, are not the same as the sequences for the second half, that is six through 10, right? The other really kind of important conceptual point that I wanna make here, and that, that is that it's very interesting and important that the substrate and ion binding sites are right in the neighborhood of where these large conformational changes occur. And in fact, a number of the residues that contribute to the ion binding sites are backbone carbonyl oxygens whose conformation changes dramatically when you open to the inside. And thus, one of the things that opening to the inside does is it disrupts substrate and ion binding site. It disrupts the binding sites <clears throat> and thus it allows one to understand how ions in particular can readily unbind in this inward open state, okay? So the inward open state promotes uh, transport by allowing ions not only a solvent accessible pathway to diffuse to the cytoplasm, but also by simply disrupting their binding site, okay? So, um, 
So I'll conclude with uh, this last portion of my talk with a summary slide, and that is to tell you that we now have multiple confirmations of LUT in different states, that is APO, outward occluded, and this inward APO state. And what I'd like to know, now show you is a morph between the APO occluded and inward open conformations derived from these crystal structures. And again, this is just an approximation based on these crystal structures, but it shows binding of substrate, opening to the inside, and substrate and ions released, binding of substrate again, the small movement that's involved in occlusion to the outside, the larger movement that seals this extracellular gate, and then the very dramatic conformational change that occurs on the inside, and especially with TM1A, that allows for substrates and ions to be released. <clears throat> and so one of, the, one of the hallmarks, of course, of transporters, as I mentioned before, is that these gates are coupled. How are they coupled? Well, one example of how they're coupled is this TM segment right here, TM segment five. And it turns out that when TM1A moves outward to allow substrates to unbind, it pushes against TM segment five, which in turn presses against the region of the transporter at the top, thus closing the extracellular gate. So these transmembrane segments that surround the internal TM segments help to couple conformational changes of the transporter again. <clears throat> closure of the extracellular gate, substrate unbinding, substrate binds, extracellular gate closes, cytoplasmic gate opens, substrates and ions unbind. Okay, so um, I'll stop here and just acknowledge many of the people who are involved in this work over the years. Atsuko uh, started uh, the LUTI project and was then joined by Satender Shane and Harini. The Aporoceptor project was commenced by Neely, Sun, and Guo Cheng, subsequently worked on by Rich, Jay, Mike, and Sasha. Mike and Sasha determined the structure of the intact receptor. We collaborated with Mark Mayer and Michelle Horning at the NIH on the topic of uh, the mechanism of desensitization. And of course, we received general, generous support from many uh, funding agencies. And, and now we have the pleasure of doing our research in the Pacific Northwest, which of course, I would all encourage you to come and visit at some point when you have time. Thank you. Well, I think you will agree with me that that was absolutely a masterful presentation of the deep structure of both AMPA receptors and transporters with wonderful insights which are clearly based on a lot of work and thinking very hard about what the structures and he brought home to us the kind of the mechanisms which we need to understand these, the, these, these topics with. And at the same time, of course, I'm, I think we should also congratulate Eric on being able to link these fine details of mechanism with issues of synaptic transmission and transport, which really of profound importance to both pharmacologists and, and, uh, and uh, clinicians at, at the same time. So Eric, thank you very much for giving the 2013 annual uh, review prize lecture. And we have a small token of our appreciation here, which we'd like to present you with, which is the uh, annual review prize lecture brick um, to Eric Guo. Thank you very much, Eric.